Let's get this over with. Sir, O5 Council must never- Direct orders from the Council. My expendability has been reached, it seems. Sir! Jacobs! He could kill you. I'm dead either way. Never was partial to a bullet. Close camera feeds. If my death is caught on film, I don't want to give them the satisfaction. Already done. And sir, good luck. I will be conducting a mandatory interview with the SCP designated as 049, also known as the Plague Doctor. This interview is taking place at the Bridge Facility, July 27th, 2018. Due to the nature of containment and history thereof with the subject, your cooperation in these proceedings is required under penalty of any and all privileges being revoked. Do you understand the terms? It's good to see you again, Administrative Oversight Jacobs. Pleasant to encounter a familiar face. Site Director. Answer the question. We overvoked the security No. Et tu peux parler anglais. As you wish. Come to co-opt another service of me. You promised me a worthwhile test subject last time. He had to meet his end elsewhere. More's the pity. In him I sensed so much of the pestilence building. Twisting his very DNA, corrupting all life around him. If I remember correctly, it was your offer of Mr. Lambert's body that brought your delay from undergoing my procedure. Unless you want to go fishing in an acid bath to find it, I wouldn't get your hopes up that that promise will ever be fulfilled. Now the years have passed. My list of patients grows stale, and the pestilence has made a meal of you. It festers even now, greater than any I've witnessed before. You won't be able to buy your way out this time, my friend. I know. However, I am willing to entertain your notion of an interview, for old time's sake. Mercy for the infected. That's not like you, Doctor. Call it a mellowing of nature. Or the smell of lavender from your breast pocket. I'm feeling... indulgent. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? How did you come to be taught about the Great Pestilence? Did anyone teach you the skills you currently possess? Where did it come from? The Great Pestilence is older than you could possibly comprehend. Any chance I could get some actual details? It is a factual enough answer. It's evasive and only the first goddamn question! Point director! I know! I... I know. Look. I'll make this simple. Answer me appropriately, and you don't spend the rest of containment in a one-by-one -one cell. You drive a hard bargain. Very well. No. I had no pedagogue to instruct me on the ways of the pestilence, nor the intricacies of treatment. What has been gleaned has all been derived from personal interactions and studies, or was, until my access to resources was unwisely stemmed. What of its origins? Ah, now that is a mystery I cannot help but be vague with. Wherefore, indeed, Theories abound, but none are set in stone. Judging from how intertwined the pestilence is with its victims, tied directly into every molecule and fiber, most, if not all, life upon this world is infected, carried from birth it seems, so it may be hereditary. If it's as old as you claim, why hasn't it mutated into something more lethal? Why haven't we been wiped out? That is not the nature of the pestilence. It cannot exist without a host. Like any virus, it must maintain its ecosystem. But the changes are small, unnoticeable, minuscule. Perhaps it existed within the primordial soup from which life first erupted into being, piggybacking off the first sentient creatures to take root on Earth. 
mayhaps an offshoot of some prehistoric or neolithic variant of human ancestry, interbreeding with a deformity, creating a sequence of genes that retroactively attack and overwhelm its host. Layman's terms, Doctor. Or has the pestilence merely become unavoidable, where all infants are born pure, but immediately exposed to its effects through contact, nutrients? Too young and indefensible to protect themselves, they wouldn't stand a chance. Would a single party benefit from a virus such as this? Is it a means for control? Or an insertion of power? What does any of that mean? It means what it is always meant. Behind all the theorizing and contemplation, my eons of study, I don't know. But how did you come into contact with it? You must have had a first patient. And like most in my profession, each and every one bleeds together. I recall minute details. A solitary merchant on the road, desperately clinging to his wares for safety. Twin sisters, barely alive in desperate need of relief. Their parents, lords, queens, nobles, and peasants. Rich, poor, disenfranchised, well-to-do. An ocean of patience. I, I get the picture. You must remember where it all began for you. An overgrown cottage on the outskirts of a decrepit, battle-worn castle. I had been passing by on my way from... I cannot recall. When I was flagged down by a distressed servant to a prince. Healers were scarce in the region, and so my services were desperately sought. The prince's bride had been struck with an ailment of unknown origin and her life was feared in jeopardy. However, upon reaching the hut, separated from the rest of the court to keep the illness from spreading, I discovered the source. Origin of the pestilence? Not quite. While her ailment was severe, his was far greater. The symptoms were present, if subdued, but I felt a great well of pestilence within. Not the source, but a carrier, capable of spreading it far and wide. I could not allow any of them to refuse treatment. I would go against any ethical code I hold dear. You killed them all. Cured them all. First the cottage, then the castle. They were willing at first, but much like yourself, they were displeased with the results. They opted to flee and burn the castle with myself and their healed brethren trapped inside. They thought much like you, that I create monsters from the ill. That is the farthest from the truth. I create life. It is not I who destroys what they do not understand. And it was here that I learned that in order to achieve what must be done to eradicate the pestilence, I would have to be as ruthless as I am dedicated. And look where that's got you. Exactly where I need to be. For here is where I can best influence the outcome of the pestilence's spread, given the power to do so. Are you immune to the pestilence? I am more than well equipped to prevent the strain being passed on to me. That wasn't my question. Hmm? Are you immune to the pestilence? Have you been infected since birth like the rest of us? Or have you managed to whip up some kind of miracle cure just for yourself? I'm not sure I understand the meaning of your inquiry. You've said every living thing on Earth has this thing. According to you, I have it. Yet I don't feel anything wrong with me. An insidious virus, is it not? But that's not what we're talking about. Focus, 049. My apologies, but your words aren't making much sense. It borders on incoherent babbling. Oh, Christ, you're as bad as my ex. Pardon? Never mind. 
Once more, you've maintained all organic life carries the pestilence, correct? That would be an accurate assumption. You've also theorized that it lays semi-dormant within us from an early age, childhood. Not altogether correct, but yes, this is a valid conclusion. Then if you too were born as helpless as other children exposed, would that not also make you a carrier? I... I do not believe so. Well, why not? You're just as likely as anyone else, by your own logic. That is untrue. I possess many methods of combating infection. Uh, yes, now you too. But what about before? I do not understand what you're saying. This is nonsense. As nonsensical as a sick doctor treating patients just as ill as he is? If you are infected, aren't you more likely to spread this pestilence rather than contain it? Is it possible that the only reason you find it wherever you go is because it follows you? Stop. Stop. Cease this. I'm willing to answer your queries, but as part of an interview, not an inquisition. Is that understood? Despite appearing to be wearing a medieval plague doctor's uniform, our studies have determined your clothing is made from muscle and skin tissue. In other words, it's all part of your anatomy. My question is, how is this possible? That, my dear acquaintance, depends upon your perspective. Well? Any good doctor must single out a diagnosis in order to treat a patient, given several indications. One has led to a conclusion, and thus the road to a cure. But in order to walk the proper path of healing, one must be sure they are tracing the cause, and not the symptom. Which one are you then? The cause or the symptom? Et donc, l'étudiant deviant le merde. How does that saying go? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. It astounds me how similar in mentality humanity is to a virus, how eager you are to assimilate another, simply because you can. You excuse it through reason of feeling, but all the same, you carry out your shared function without fail. Are you saying that plague doctors were inspired by you? I can hardly call what those impostors became an inspiration. A virus would not be so if it were not for its imperfections, in its attempt to impersonate. The virus is unable to change one perdurable difference, itself. An imitation is still an imitation, no matter how many skins you wear, or reasons to justify your appearance. To say they lost sight of the importance of my work is to imply they even understood that concept in the first place. They didn't believe you. They watched, they learned, and then they left. To kill colds and coughs and broken bones. Insignificant in the wake of such destruction as the pestilence presents. These doctors call themselves men of science, but elect to ignore the enormous catastrophe waiting on the doorstep. Why would I associate myself with such blind stupidity? And yet, their blind stupidity has created a wealth of knowledge in the ways of treating the ill, not just with medicine, but dignity. From the Dark Ages, new science has brought about the health and well-being of billions across centuries of study. Is that not a thing to be proud of? And in their ignorance, have merely healed the sick in order to further propagate the pestilence, prolonging the inevitable downfall. All your treatments and advances are meaningless buying you only temporary respite. What good is dignity in medicine against the wrath of the pestilence? Then again, that's not what my question was about. You're very eager to remain ignorant of the subject at hand, 049. Are you afraid to answer? Ridiculous. Then answer me. I am as such because I was born as such. Do humans question their own anatomy? Do they claim awareness of life before Neanderthal? Do you hold any perception of time before birth, before life, before creation? 
do you know or do you rely on observation and history to write the past for you? You don't know. Hell of a roundabout way of saying as much. But we know something of your anatomy. Your skeletal structure, though enveloped in this, is still human. Is it possible you were human at some point? Flesh is still flesh, regardless of its shape. While the bones lay the foundations, the rest of the structure is influenced by its environment, tailored to best suit its needs. Are you saying you're like this because of evolution? I would not label myself as such. What I am saying is that my construction, indifferent of similar traits, was made to carry out a singular purpose. And that is my only concern. Are you the only one of your kind? Of... doctors? No. Of you. Beings like you. If there are, or ever have been, we have never encountered one another. Nor have I particularly dedicated myself to finding out the answer to your question. You've never been curious at all? Finding out whether or not you are truly the only one of your kind? My kind, as you put it? rests less on the physiognomy of my person, and more upon the practice. My kind are men of science, logic, and reason. Medical practitioners, not species. Since it is quite clear any biological classification would be useless given my own personal lack of health issues, I have no use for one. I am not diagnosing myself. How very selfless of you. I suppose we would have encountered another by now, if there were more of you in the world. Perish the thought. Well, instead of another of your race, what about colleagues or assistants? Have you ever had an apprentice? Several over the last millennia and a half. Some who remained after the rest abandoned my work. Others who followed after witnessing my prowess in the field. The countless lives I had saved was not unnoticed by a few. They had their uses, in spite of their impediments. You mean, despite the fact they carried the pestilence? They groveled at the opportunity to stand by my side, and help absolve humanity of this plague. Are you sure they weren't begging for their lives, whatever it took to keep it? The chance to pass on my knowledge to a willing party is not an opportunity to squander. I had hoped, given time, their fear would be converted into understanding that my work takes precedent over all other worldly concerns, and therefore all methods in its treatment were necessary. And, pray tell, what was the success rate for these students becoming enlightened? Ultimately, Nyot. That sounds disappointing. Your sarcasm is poorly concealed. I should try to try harder next time. Do all of these people bleed together, as did your patients, or are there one or two that stood out above the rest? Yolanda. The name? She must have been special. I rested more hope on her than any before or since. None truly seemed to grasp the pestilence as well as she. Her family had lost their battle with another sickness spreading across Europe at the time, but Yolanda had managed to avoid contamination. She crawled out of the filth like a rat, and despite the pestilence's grasp on her, something within me stayed by hand. I sensed a higher purpose for her, and she was willing to follow. Jesus, how old was she? I am not certain. I do not tend to judge by a specific age, but she was a child, make no mistake. She showed remarkable resilience both in survival instinct and mentality. The things she saw with me, traveling together for nearly a decade, would have broken most men's minds. And her senses in detecting the pestilence impressed even me. She could see it? Oh yes, she could identify exactly who had it in her room with absolute accuracy. According to you, 
that's everyone. But she believed. We would sit and discuss the pestilence by a fire. She even taught me to appreciate the clarity of a mind after a well-cooked meal. I hadn't eaten food until she had came along. That reminds me of... Yes? Just... Someone I knew. They're gone now. The infamous interviewer. I've heard whispers of his exploits. A shame I could not have made its acquaintance. He would have made a most interesting study. Anyway, you were saying... Hmm. I sensed in Yolanda unease. She was no longer a child, and through her life had seen much exposure. To the pestilence? To humanity. The logical, impartial side of her was giving way to a sympathetic soul who saw her patience as more than just that. She was growing attached, and it was interfering with the necessity of our work. More and more, she began to question the path she had chosen, and the expression she made around the surgical table grew coarser. Sometimes I feel morality can be as deadly a plague as the worst of them. Morality keeps people from forgetting that all life is important. Your ethics are how you enact that. All life is important. Of course I know that. But there are things that must be done to ensure survival of it. Everything you do is morally wrong. It goes against everything doctors stand for. Can't you see just how much you have hurt people? And you are in a position to judge over me. When we first met, you attempted to elicit me into murder. From what I understand, we SCP are little more than refuse disposal to you. What I do is selfless, a cause to benefit all mankind and beyond. You kill for your own benefit. You think it's what I want? Lambert was a threat to us both. And I am always under the Council's thumb. Just following orders. I've walked many battlefields in my lifetime. Atrocities you wouldn't even imagine, left out in the open for all the world to see. Survivors on both sides would crawl to me with what little strength they had left and beg. It wasn't my fault. I was just following instructions. They were the enemy. I have no enemy. All are patients in my eyes but you. You're just one more in a long line of monsters, excusing your crimes on the basis of following orders. Do you deny this? No. Admitting the problem exists is the first step to finding the cure. And what about Jolanda? What became of her? We happened upon a village in the midst of an epidemic. I wanted to administer my cure, but Yolanda insisted on an alternative treatment for their current ailments. She was turning into one of those who had betrayed me and lost their way. I admit to feeling disappointment in her, especially as she forbade me from curing them. She said she would keep me from them, no matter the cost. Did you leave? No. She had not outlived the pestilence's influence, nor moralities. I had to stop it there, her, uh, then the town. It was not an enjoyable experience, but it had to be done. The calling demands it. Following orders. If everyone has contracted the pestilence, might that not mean it's just the next stage in our evolutionary line? <laughs> Is there something funny? On the contrary. It's an interesting concept. I suppose I could understand how a layman such as yourself might be goaded into believing such a proposition. Genetic evolution, possibly being perceived as a type of deformity, leading towards an actual growth or supplement, marking an improvement upon a life form. However, you are missing a key component. I know what it is. You can't possibly understand what it's like to sense the pestilence. I can feel it throughout my body. I can see it, taste it, smell. Get close enough, I can hear the individual molecules churning. 
but it's not just physical sensations of stimuli. I can feel the emotion of its presence, how it affects me. That tells me all I need to know about the pestilence. What is it you feel? Fear. As to whether it is my own, or a projection from the victim's own subconscious, screaming for help. Like they know deep down that something is horribly wrong. I cannot say. Have you ever felt like there is something inherently wrong in the world? With you? Something you can't see? But an instinct buried so far into your soul, it's calling to warn you. It's part of the human condition. Everybody has it. And the pestilence has everyone. Everybody has a pulse too. But just because I say someone is dead on the inside doesn't stop it from being subjective. Bosley, you have proven my point. You cannot sense it like I can. You do not even register its existence outside of our discussions. So how can you even make a claim that it could be the future of your species? Has there ever been anyone immune to it? If I had ever found any instance of a naturally occurring immunity within a life, do you not think my role here would be complete? With it, I could easily derive a cure. But the pestilence is universal. There may still be hope. If you'd been looking for an immune individual as long as I have, you too would have lost all semblance of hope. It will never happen. And your being here, your position at my mercy, also means that you too have given up hope. What say you, Site Director Jacobs? Is my inquiry, like your suffering, finally at a close? Not quite yet. Sir, it's here. Waiting just outside. Thank you. Disengaged locks. I expected. Our own doctors had reason to conduct an extended autopsy. What can you make of it? We shall see. You object. What? Your ilk and I have had our disagreements on the nature of my practice. They simply refuse to understand what it is I am trying to accomplish. Oh, they understand, all right. And if the pestilence, if there even is such a thing, presents as much a threat as you imply, then I don't think anyone would argue with your goals. You present as skeptic and adaptable, an invaluable combination. The real issue science has with you is your methodology. All in the name of saving lives. At an inhuman cost. If any of you understood the true consequences the pestilence has on mankind, none would argue with the costs. Every cut, every incision brings my work a step closer to perfecting a cure and ridding this scourge from every organism preventing further outbreaks from arising. Is that not what you want? Trying to convince us to fear the theoretical. And yet, when a madman claims to have witnessed a spirit, there will be more than a few to rally and support. Perhaps humanity finds it easier to believe in lesser threats than an extinction-level plague. Our doctors and scientists have spent years trying to follow your research to reach the same conclusion that this pestilence even exists. Nothing. Any help on your end always results in the same convenient dead end. You give us your journal for study. The text is untranslatable. We ask for a list of symptoms, too many and varied to pinpoint a single illness. Even your methods of treatment- I admit, but trial and error. They were people! Have you ever bothered to stop and ask who it is you're torturing? It is not torture to safeguard the future. Bullshit! 
I've seen what becomes of your experiments. That is not a cure. It is beyond torture. They lose every remnant of themselves after you've had your way with them. And there is no way to live. Your cure isn't worth the cost. It may be. One day. Even now. I am content with the results, given the alternative. And what about him? The man you're operating on right now? Have you considered what cure he'll settle for? What costs he'll accept? Of course not. You just poke and prod and twist everything inside until you feel the disease is eradicated. But so is the man! What's the point in a cure if nothing of us remains? What was his name? This subject? This... person? Gregory Slyne. He was an engineer. A science none too distant from my own. Men and machine are far more similar than most care to admit. Operations, communication, internal network, fuel and failability. How did he die? Why does it matter? Because I cannot cure him. Of course not. He's already dead. There are no traces of the pestilence in his system. However, there are clear signs of its presence at some point in time prior to death. When Gregory Slime died, he did so cured. How is that possible? I am unsure, but the results speak for themselves. They tell you. That with perseverance and dedication, a cure may yet be possible. You may remove him. Do not fear. He won't rise again. I have been satiated. For the moment. What use do you find from your proxies? The cured. They are invaluable to my research. For starters, their behavior. The very state of being reflects the effectiveness of my treatments. And... how would you gauge its effectiveness right now? I have a revival rate of 95%. A key component to eradicating the infection. Living beings cannot survive the shock of being torn from the grips of the pestilence. And how satisfied are you with the results? How the person survives, and not just the body? That is a tough one not to crack. Granted, much of the mind alters as a consequence, and physically there are permanent alterations, but there are benefits. Benefits? How? For example, the cured can now detect pestilence carriers and neutralize them. You mean they kill anyone in their path and rip them apart like animals? Had they the medical knowledge I possess, perhaps they... You're brushing what they do aside because they don't have your medical skills? Regardless, it does not matter. I am still able to perform my part on the cadavers they leave behind. Right. Do you need further explanation? Oh, no. I get it. It's sick and twisted logic, but I understand. I'm almost afraid to ask what isn't justified because of the pestilence. How much you let yourself get away with. I have no personal gain from any of this. More subjects to experiment on? Isn't that the only thing you've ever wanted from us? From anyone? To cure. If I wanted to wipe out all life on Earth, believe me, I could. Very easily. Alright. Show me there's something behind that mask that isn't just flesh. Has there ever been someone you've not been able to save? In spite of all opposing views, her betrayal of everything I'd worked so hard to accomplish, I had hoped to save Yolanda. I thought that she, of all people, would be more resilient. That not much of her would perish during the process. But... she never did. She never came back. It was as though her spirit refused my services. This is the second time you've alluded to a soul. Is that something you believe in? I have no reason to disbelieve it. And I am not blind to the absence of it from those I cure. 
Or perhaps a more apt term would be suppression. You mean you think those people's souls are trapped inside of the cured? Again, I have not said I believe in such a thing. But I would rather believe the cured still have a chance of returning to their former selves. If their souls have been purged, then that is an impossibility. Given what you just said, has there ever been someone you have cured, but would have rather let die? How much do you know of my history? Everything we've catalogued thus far. Then you should remember an incident with one of my first doctors from the Foundation staff, Dr. Raymond Ham. I don't think anyone who knows about you doesn't also know about Ray. Did you know him? Not personally, but we had interacted in the past on administrative assignments. He was a good man. You don't get many like him within the Foundation, it seems. Try the world. I haven't talked about him in years. When I did, I mentioned little remorse for his demise. With the addition of time, I have come to understand several truths. The first is that I can sometimes judge one too harshly based on their knowledge and bearing of the pestilence. The other is that I regret taking his life when I did. When you did? He might have understood, given time, and I may have also found a breakthrough with his help, developed a vaccine, made the need for terminating a patient to treat a redundancy. But I panicked, and the man paid a terrible price. If souls do exist, I subjected him to a claustrophobic and demeaning existence inside his own body. When your task force put him down, I'd hoped it was quick. It was. Good. Now, site director, I wish to move on to the next question. This line has run out of avenues. Are you aware of any SCPs that have the Pestilence? Yes, and no. It will be difficult to point out a select few, unless you have several in mind. Well, why don't we start with 106, the old man. Oh yes, him. A rather fascinating specimen. I can see why you would link him to the Pestilence, and although he does carry the strain with him, his figurative and literal ethereal state is not a result of the infection. The man literally dissolves metal and melts his way into pocket dimensions. If that is not an advanced case of pestilence infection, then what is? I have not allowed a full cycle of the pestilence to be completed in any one subject. To do so would be immoral. To study? Diagnose? What kind of doctor doesn't try to understand what they're treating to the greatest degree? If you are done, sir, reprimanding me for saving lives once more, perhaps we can move on to another example. Fine. SCP-008. It's a form of virus that reduces brain function, limits mobility, and increases necrotic decay, all whilst keeping the infected alive. Some refer to it as a zombie plague. Sound familiar? I believe so, but I can't quite... Ah, the one from Russia. Correct? As far as we know. No idea what they're doing with the stuff, but that's where it's from. Any correlation between it and the Pestilence? Hardly. But should the Pestilence no longer threaten Earth, my next recommendation would be to purge this 008 from existence. So you know what it's capable of. What was your takeaway from it? Limited. Given my current priorities, but it did not seem to me to be born of this Earth. And if that is the case, was its arrival here coincidence? A mistake? Or a calculated move? I suppose that's a mystery for the Russians to worry about. Alright, um... What about an inanimate object, like... 079? The intelligent machine, not in so far as I know, but there is every chance that it may be an unwitting puppet of the pessimist's design. But how? He's a computer. Do not underestimate where the pestilence may strike from. Even my senses cannot detect it at all times. And it is so very clever. 
Who knows which shape it will take next. Right. I guess... How's about your old friend? 035. Friend, if he says so. Again, it is a difficult affliction to diagnose him things. Such as him. But what about the black goo? Surely that has to be something related to the pestilence. Is that what he told you? It is true that there are trace levels of pestilence in his excrement. But dormant levels. Nothing I can do anything with. But the mask himself holds no pestilence so far as I can tell. Just like 079? Yes. Alright then. Now. 343. Three. God. So he claims. I do not believe I have had any interactions with such an individual. And they say they are a deity. The deity. The only one, according to him. After the experiences of my life, I have little evidence to believe a god could be responsible for so much suffering. And the vastness of his egotism. Set the kettle to the pot. Pardon? Nothing. In any case, if they are a living creature, it is more than likely the pestilence has them in its grasp as well. Such a shame. Well, that leaves one last candidate. SCP-001. Thoughts? You do know the one I am referring to. Yes. I can only hope it does not have the pestilence in its system. Why is that? If so, my work is meaningless, as is the function of all life. Understood. Get that? Zero three five spoke about how he accompanied you across Europe during the spread of the Black Plague. He said that not only were you able to resurrect the dead and injured to perfect health, but that you wore him on occasion. <laughs> Dio does have a wicked imagination for storytelling. What tale did he weave this time? Was he the reincarnation of Apophis? An embodiment of Loki? Was I an accomplice in his duplicitous acts? Or were we rivals? Friends? Or foes? He said- no matter. Anything he says is neither truth nor lie. Reality simply does not matter to a creature of his habit. Well then, what is your recollection of 035? I had picked up the scent of a pestilence mass across Europe, growing in size. My path led me through Bosnia, where I encountered 035 on a merchant train. Right. 035 said he had been abandoned in an attack. No such attack took place. He was not a forgotten trinket on the roadside. He was running one of the stalls. As soon as he laid eyes on me, he flagged me down. You seem like an individual looking for a cure to all your problems. He quipped with his forked tongue. Come browse my wares. Every item of purchase, all of his stock, carried with it a tale of incredible utilization against some ailment or injury. Snake venom that reduces inflammation, a variant of the oriental snake oil, leeches that clean blood in infected areas and re-inject stronger nutrient-filled cells, rabbit dung, elephant urine, unicorn horn. He claimed to own a piece of palliative care from every corner of the earth. A fallacy all. He was a con man who could no more cure the common cold than he could keep consistency. No doubt he had suckered in several of those doctors who adopted my persona. He believed he could do the same with me. So when he presented arsenic as a way to ease sore throats, I implored him to please demonstrate. And did he? If there was one positive I can give to that cretin, he is very dedicated, much like myself. He drank the tonic and to my surprise did not falter. When I pointed out my observations of arsenic poisoning, he admitted to my superior knowledge on the matter, confessed to conning previous doctors along the path, and became interested in my trade. He inquired as to what I specialized in, to which I responded, the pestilence. He believed I meant the plague, the current fascination of all in the medical profession. But no, I explained. Not wishing to extend my stay, I hastily departed. That's it. 
That's your only interaction? Unfortunately, no. Unbeknownst to myself, he stalked me across Europe and observed my practice. Eventually he came forward and attempted to assault me. He did what? While leaving Venice, I encountered him along a pier. At that time, I did not recall who he was. But all the same, 035 lunged at me. I touched his host and rendered him immobile. You mean, you killed the host? The host had already expired. I merely made the body useless to him. I sailed back to Trieste in Slovenia and headed north toward Austria and Germany. Again, he pursued me further up the road. More and more over the centuries I would see him, and soon his face became etched into my mind, almost as vividly as the pestilence. Every time he would attempt to remove my mask in order to supplant my mind with his will, he did not understand. At first, his appearances were nothing more than a mere nuisance, until he began to take my avoidance personally. On our next encounter in Belgium, he ensured it would be an event I could not ignore. Knowing 035, I'd venture a guess and say it was psychotic. The trail of pestilence I had been tracking diverged, leading me to Hedstein Castle in Antwerp. That was not its name at the time, but I understand it was rebuilt many years later. I arrived at the gates, sealed shut, and the only sound from within was crying and screaming. I believed that the pestilence had reached a new stage of mutation. That is until I saw him through the bars of the gate. He gave me a single ultimatum. Allow him to possess me, or have my precious patience die. But your mask is your face. I explained as much, but he was convinced I was lying to save my skin. It did not take long for his patience to run out. He stared at me as he nonchalantly tossed the torch onto the pyre, the flames spreading quickly into the hall, engulfing the castle and everyone inside within minutes. I had no time for petty games. I turned my back on him and cast it from my mind. What did he do after that? He realized two things. One, I had been telling the truth about my face. Two, I was no doctor he had ever encountered before. From here, he focused on being friendly, with all prospects of ever possessing me diminished. 035 may do, studying me as intently as I study a fresh cadaver. I returned the interest in kind by studying his attributes, to discern if there was anything of value from keeping his company. The mask itself was uninteresting, but the excrement proved somewhat more fascinating. 035's hosts appeared nullified whatever pestilence had been present prior to death. I attempted to create a synthetic ointment based on its design, but there was something inherent in its makeup that I could not simulate without keeping the excrement's acidic qualities. By the time my interest had dissolved, I had developed a new reputation. How so? 035 had begun a rumor associating me with the omen of death. This image of myself spread faster than a virulent disease. Before long, I was being chased into the streets, out of townships, and cross borders. 035 himself spurred on several of the lynch mobs against me. Eastern Europe had been poisoned by his influence, and I knew then that his usefulness had run out. It was mid-19th century by now, and cholera had begun to grip Italy upon a return. We reminisced about times past, and eventually led 035 to our first patient. Only the house I took him to had not had a soul within for many years. I took 035 to the crypt below convincing him that their sick were being quarantined within. The gullible fool felt it was very atmospheric. I shut him in and made sure the door could never be opened. That is, until your organization set him free. Yeah, we regret it too, sorry. My only relief is that he is being held far away from me. Well, um, actually, the site you're being transferred to Oh no. Sorry about that. Let us hope they never put us in the same room. Is it... Uh, is it possible the pestilence is a sixth sense for you? That it senses oncoming death and you 
Arts Harbinger. Given a sufferer's ultimate fate, I could not differentiate the function of the pestilence from that of death. Why did you surrender to us so easily? Should I have fought it? Well, we're rather glad you didn't, but the circumstances of your capture are... suspicious. How so? Well, until months prior, we hadn't the notion of your existence, and it just so happens that one of our operatives manages to escape your proxies without you noticing. It is not a prerogative of mine to obscure my presence from the world. And then there's the capture itself. When we found you, several of your proxies attacked. We were delayed, and I'm almost certain you knew we were coming, and yet, when you had every chance to run, you decided to stay. In fact, you watched us. Did you want to be detained? Detained is such a harsh term. Temporary accommodation is more appropriate. Ken the smartass remarks, I'm tired of you all treating this facility as though it were a resort. Now answer the question, why are you here? You claim to have been observing me, but I was watching you for much longer. What you do, how you operate, the stock of your subjects. But what attracted me here most of all were your morals, your ethics. A distinct lack of both. Just enough for me to see a glimmer of myself. The Foundation is dedicated, ruthless, and willing to do whatever it must to ensure the survival of the human race against such an overwhelming threat. I knew then that being amongst you would be of great benefit to my research. In fearing the pestilence, you would provide me with a sterile working environment, protection, and most importantly, subjects. Well, that backfired, didn't it? Since we've not actually found a shred of evidence that proves the pestilence even exists. For all we know, it could be just a figment of your imagination, a justification for an incessant need to kill and disfigure all life to suit your own design. Which one am I supposed to believe more? That you surrendered in order to work with us to fight the greatest plague ever to face man, or that you're using us through a thinly developed ploy to make us accomplices through fear in your secret bid to create a world all of your own design? The only other option I can see is that you're completely insane. Believe what you will, sir. But in a matter of minutes, none of your truths will matter, for you will be dead, and I will go on. Last question, Doc. What will you do after you have cured the pestilence? Or do you believe this is an impossible goal to strive for? If it were impossible, or I believed it so, that would not keep me from attempting to rectify the problem. But wouldn't that seem pointless? Futile? If you loved or believed in someone or something so much that it was tied to the very fate of your soul, and fighting for that thing appeared impossible to succeed, would you still not fight for it? Would it still not be worth giving every ounce of yourself for, even when all other hope is lost? I wouldn't know. I've learned to diagnose many symptoms of pain. Do not think you can hide yours from me. It's the kind of pain that leads many to commit great and terrible atrocities. Though they think they are justified through their loss, that is never the case. Such is the fate I see for you. Like you said, it won't matter soon. I'll die with many regrets, but at least that won't be one. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Hamlet? No, just something 035 would mutter to himself from time to time. He would often ruminate on subjects such as death and the human condition. How most feared the consequences of a life filled with evil to be themselves evil and so spent their lives too concerned with the afterlife to live. I have never held such a perspective. I do not believe there is an afterlife waiting for me. 
much like you perhaps do not think there is one for you. I am certain that once this pestilence is eradicated, my function is complete, and I will simply cease. You wouldn't turn to another illness? It is not my design. Much like a life after death is not in my design. But suppose you were wrong in your assumption. Suppose there is a life after death for you. Would you suffer for the wrongs in your life? Or would you suffer for the good deeds you fail to act upon? Destiny is not a predetermined plan, but the inevitable result of the actions you perform. When death comes, do you feel you have fulfilled your purpose? Or do you feel there is more in life for you to achieve? Done. No more questions. Then it is time. <sighs> okay. Sir, I can still get you out of there. There's no need. No interference. To... But sir! That's an order. Any final requests? Will it hurt? Yes. Good. Just stand there. Kill me, damn it! Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I don't understand. I thought you wanted me dead. I do. But it appears you have another fate in store for yourself. The best one has proceeded. It no longer infests you to such a horrific degree. The sudden change. It bears potential. Keeping you alive may yet be worth the benefits. Do now. Live on. Act upon instinct. Shape your own future. Oh. And should I encounter your dear friend Watch at this new facility? I'll be sure to send him my warmest regards. Sir! Are you okay? Fine. Fine. What do you want to do with him now? Somehow, I have to report my failure to die to the O5 Council. What do you think he meant by the pestilence has receded? I don't know. Sir, I... Uh, sorry, I, I didn't knock. Is there any news? No, sir. No developments from the surface. I didn't mean from them. No, sir. Watch hasn't made contact. Do you expect him to? He's probably long dead by now. So many SCPs. Many of the most dangerous ones, too. How could he survive? After everything we've seen. I can't believe he'd go out like this. No. Isaac is alive. I'm almost certain. Even then? What can we do? What little we can. Sergeant, ensure that anyone matching Watch's description who reaches the surface is not shot. I'll deal personally with anyone who disobeys. Yes, sir. And Sergeant, Drop the sir. We've known each other long enough, the crewmen. Will do, Jacobs. Speak! 
God damn it! Hello, watch. Jacobs. I know your instinct right now is to hang up on me. But unfortunately, we've both run out of time to hold grudges. Suffice it to say, I don't want you dead. I'm just glad you found this phone. Reyes didn't seem like he needed it. But you tried to have me killed. That puts you on the same playing field as everything in here trying to do the same. I should be asking for more, but give me one good reason why I should listen to you. Because if we want to fight the future and lay the foundations of what comes next, then we must work together. Our goals are the same. I see that now. But to survive, you have to do exactly what... Thanks for the escort. Not like I saved your sorry asses or anything. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? So what now? You gonna manipulate me some more? Make me talk to these SCPs? Get them dancing to your little tune? Everything go back to normal now? Ain't happening. I know now. I know why you put me there. It was all a goddamn test. No. I put you there because there's been something you've been hiding from me, whether you realize it or not. Whatever it is, has kept you safe. But believe me, I wouldn't have sent you there if the decision were up to me. Then who was it? You talk to me about being honest and keeping secrets, but you don't tell me jack shit. Well, I'm tired of it. I'm done. You can take your little experiments and find another patsy. The O5 Council. It was a ploy. All of it. Staged. Went to draw out people they'd suspected of being members of the Chaos Insurgency for a long time. So many high-profile SCPs in one area, so many of their operatives in one place, a gold mine for them. At the same time, it was a test for people like you. People who exhibit abilities beyond our understanding. You survived the impossible watch. And I know you saw things at C2 that were beyond your comprehension. You may very well be an SCP. I saw. What I did see. Couldn't be real. What about the breakout I was framed for? I was nowhere near 682 or 079. How could I- I know. And they knew too. The evidence was obviously planted. But they had reason to send you to C2 anyway. They used it as an excuse. And I played along. I'm sorry. All my career here, I've tried to fight against their bloody whims. We have an ethics committee, and for what? Half their members are funded by the council, and the other half are just as corrupt or eager to abuse the system. For years I have tried to block them, divert the course. Before one of their harebrained schemes really does some damage we simply can't walk away from, or delete from someone's memory. And no one, no one, I can trust. Most of my life, watching over my back, trying to be better than they are, making this place better. But I gave up. I lost hope. I gave in. I almost gave you up with it. You are the first person in a long time who I can actually trust. Because I know where you stand. I know just how much you want that change to happen. And you would do it in an instant. I used to be like that. I can't let you do this on your own. Because otherwise, you'll turn out exactly like me. Whether you can ever learn to trust me back, that's up to you. One more thing. The footage. 
of the 682079 breakout was anonymously sent to me to clear your name. It's from a closed camera feed outside of the official Foundation security network. The person is blurred, but clearly it isn't you. Feel free to review it. The details of our next assignment are on there too, and you'll need a change of clothes. Oh, and uh, your eye class clearance has been reinstated. You really seem to have a guardian angel looking out over you. But that angel was the one who framed you too. My sister. I think I saw her. At C2. Perhaps you did. We'll find out. Together. What the? Welcome back, Watch. This is a pre-recorded message designed to activate when inserted into a specific node located in your new quarters. Any attempt to preserve this message will result in self-destruction. You're probably wondering right now why I decided to set you up on a one-way trip into the D-Class pool. At the time, I figured you were just another weapon of O5's council, being used to subvert and control the other SCPs with your unique abilities. But, after seeing you in action with C2, I no longer believe that to be the case. I won't apologize, but I can offer you something better. I know you want to change things. So do I. If we work together, I know we can tear out every last shred of abuse of power in this place. And what's more, we can get the SCVs to help us out, too. The Council, and more importantly Jacobs, won't see it coming. I don't know what he's told you in the past to exonerate himself, but I don't trust him. And neither should you. The man has no past, no allegiances to anyone, not even himself. Whatever is planned for the Foundation, it can't be good. And yes, I almost got you killed. Why should you trust me? The real question is, what choice do you have? If you agree, just open up a document and type. Don't save. Don't send it anywhere. I'll see it. I'm always watching. Did you enjoy the video? Why not click the bell icon and subscribe to see more content from us at tats.videos. And now let's see the creators of this video.